Hi, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on controlling and better understanding COVID-19, the role of serology testing. Um, this is a webinar produced by EMA and in collaboration and partnership with, with Abbott, which is a great partnership. We'll be doing a series of webinars together looking at the role of the laboratory. So this is the first of a few. Um, I'm George Valiotis, and I'm the Executive Director of the European Health Management Association. EMA is a membership uh, association across all of Europe, and our vision is excellent health management for a healthy Europe. We run conferences and um, seminars like this. In fact, our big annual conference is on the 17th to the 19th of November. So if you're not already registered, make sure you do that. And you can stay abreast on our website to look at all of the different webinars that we run. Because we've had more demand for this than we can accommodate, um, you might have colleagues who've missed out on registering for this webinar, but you can watch everything back on our, um, um, on our, on our website. The recordings of this will be shown there. If we move to the um, um, to the next slide, um, I'll tell you that um, your microphone's been muted because we've got so many people joining us. But if you've got any questions at any point during the webinar, especially on the subject matter, you can go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a Q and A, um, a little Q and A box, and in there you can ask questions of the panelists, of the presenters, and we will answer them during the webinar. That's why we're here to answer those questions and share this great information. If you've got any other questions, you can go to the chat box. So you might have a practical question. Uh, um, you can do that in the chat box. As I mentioned, we're recording this, so you'll be able to um, to rewatch this and share it with your colleagues who've missed out um, and we're also live tweeting about this. Um, so what have we got installed for you today? Um, in, a, in just a second I'm going to introduce you to Julieta Villegas and she's going to talk about advancing um, efficient and timely uh, community access to SARS-CoV-2 serology tests in Europe and she's going to talk about a consensus document and how it came to be. Um, and then once she's spent about 10 minutes presenting, she's going to um, invite the panel to join her for a discussion about that exact same work. And so they're going to discuss it for about 30 minutes. And I'll remind you that at any point during this time, you can um, ask a question in the Q&A box and we're here to make sure your questions are answered. Um, once they've finished their discussion, we'll have a 10 minute Q&A with the audience. But this is the panel and what they look like. Um, and you'll see them face to face in just a moment. Um, in fact, you might even see them on the right of your screen. Their videos are, are live. But to let you know who they are, uh, we have Julieta Villegas. So she's the regional project director and public policy consultant uh, with uh, Policy Wisdom. We also have Professor Rafael Canton, who's the head of clinical microbiology department at the Madrid University Hospital Ramon y Cajal. And Ana Rita Gonzalez, uh, President and CEO. Hello to you. Um, so she's the President and CEO of Policy Wisdom. And Professor Uwe Liebert, who's the Director of the Institute for Virology at the University Hospital of Leipzig in Germany. A fantastic panel. We're going to have a great discussion. Um, and in order to do that, um, Julieta, um, and I'll hand over to you to, to share your presentation and help us improve our learning and expand our thinking. Yeah. Great, and hopefully uh, once we're done, some of those percentages will change and we sort of have a better idea in terms of the value and the role of serology testing. So great, thank you. Um, so yeah, we're absolutely thrilled to be here. I just wanna take a couple of minutes to actually set the stage for our discussion. So as we are all very aware of, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. So Europe, which was initially at the epicenter, continues to be one of the most affected regions in the world in terms of COVID cases and deaths, especially at a time when both vaccines and efficient treatments are unavailable, public health measures such as national lockdowns are not, via, not, are not a viable long-term solution um, given the negative socioeconomic impact. A key containment and prevention strategy is the detection of the virus, the, of the virus and there are various types of tests which can support important aspects such as diagnosis, such as case management, such as the, the tracking on the spread of the virus. Among the different available tests are serology tests, which brings us today to this meeting. Um, to this day, there is little recognition of the full scale of the potential benefits that serology testing can bring um, as an effective strategy to respond to the pandemic. So the, um, the paucity of the knowledge in terms of the dynamics of the immune response to the infection has led to a hesitation on recommending the use of serology tests. So clearly there is a lack um, of clear policy guidelines on the role of serology testing. And there is not a clear plan on rolling out serology testing as well. 
So taking all of this into account, there is a clear need um, for an expert consensus on the use of serology testing. And so this is how this multi-stakeholder group came about. Um, so we have a group with different backgrounds and areas of expertise that covered um, different topics and that came about to inform the development of um, a consensus paper. Ultimately, the group considered and discussed recommendations to enable both um, the recommendations and implementations of serology testing to support uh, mitigation strategies at the regional, national, and local level, and to build community awareness and guide advocacy efforts. Um, next slide, please. So the consensus document that was developed during this process has five main sections or central sections, um, and it basically uh, covers such key aspects, um, including the medical and scientific perspective on serology testing, the impact the pandemic has had on population health. So for example, patients, health systems, vulnerable communities, the broader socioeconomic impact. So for example, on labor force, um, different sectors such as tourism, the trade industry, um, the access and quality of, edu of education. What are the current um, existing limitations or challenges around serology testing? And what are the different opportunities and benefits that serology testing can bring? So this is sort of the focus and content of the document that was developed. The objective or what, what we think while, while having this document is very clear. So first, we want to understand what is the current situation or landscape in terms of the use of serology testing in Europe. Second, we want to understand what are the barriers and proposed actionable solutions um, to address such barriers to uptake serology testing? We want to ensure commitment and alignment from all different parties in terms of serology testing. And lastly, we want to identify the most appropriate and effective strategies to support all of these efforts. So how does this document came about in terms of methodology? Prior to having a consensus meeting, a draft document was prepared and circulated based on the available evidence at that time, um, which was we initiated the process between July and August, then a series of pre-calls were conducted with experts to provide additional detail and input to the document. Then we had a two-day virtual consensus meeting in which we had a series of validating questions um, to guide the discussion. And the result um, of this process is this expert consensus um, in which we have the participation of four key experts with different areas of expertise and background because what we really wanted was not only to capture um, the scientific or academic aspect or perspective, but we also wanted to include the clinical perspective, the community perspective, and we wanted to bring that about into the document. We have the, the privilege and the pleasure to have Two of our experts join us um, for this panel discussion who participated um, in the document. Um, and I just sort of want to, um, to point out that this document is in the process of being published. Um, and we hope that the paper will be available later on this year. Um, great. So now that we sort of have set the stage and we have um, sort of understood a bit of how this consensus document came about, what is the need of having a consensus document? We want to start um, by having a couple of questions around serology testing, which is um, what brings us us today. So I'm going to start um, off the discussion by um, asking Dr. Canton um, if you can sort of elaborate and sort of bring into the discussion, what is the role of SARS-CoV serology testing in the response to the pandemic? And what is the role from the hospital and laboratory settings as well? well? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to stay here with all of you. I'm very honored to be here. And I would like to thanks to Abbott Company and also to the AHMA for the organization of the meeting. So answering the question, yes, uh, and I'm very happy when I see the poll uh, that uh, at least the 50% of the of the attendants use the serology in their normal attendees of patient or or taking care of, of another um, type of, of work in the in the lab or with the with the with the patients or with the clinician. So 50% of them 
are familiar with the use of the, of the serology. So we have been speaking a lot of serology at the very beginning of the pandemic. We talk about the PCR and then we have the opportunity to use the serology uh, either in a format of a point of care and we have been using this a lot depending on the strategy you are going to use this or you are going to use a more automatic devices to produce the, uh, the testing of the antibodies. Mainly we test the IgM and also the IgG. We know there is also the AGA but there has not a lot of information about that and very few use of this and also we can use the total antibodies. So uh, mainly we are going to use in two different settings. One of them we, will be for a single patient. So we will test these patients if the patient has been in contact with the virus, with the SARS-CoV-2, and we can demonstrate either the presence at the very beginning of the IgM and also the IgG. IgG. So we can take a decision with these patients uh, with or without another results of the PCR and the second uh, use of the serology is just to take a lot of data together. And this is, for instance, the, uh, in a population, if we want to know if this population has been in contact as a global scale with the, with also with the virus. And, and this is mainly the, the, the most important use of the, of the serology. We can go in details uh, with a question or later. Thank you so much, Dr. Canton. Um, taking into consideration those benefits both from a population perspective, as you've mentioned, of serial surveillance, and then you've sort of mentioned as well um, benefits in the role at the hospital level as well. Now I would sort of want to pass um, on to Professor Liebert and ask him um, what are the biggest limitations and concerns surrounding serology testing at the time? Well, uh, again, I would like to thank uh, to be invited. Uh, and the answer to your question is quite uh, well. It, it has many two uh, many different facets. So the one thing, of course, is that all these antibody assays uh, should have a very high reliability and accuracy. That is very important. Every laboratory has to check this for its own uh, purposes. The th important uh, limitation is that there may be cross-reactivity, uh, cross-reactivity particularly to the seasonal coronaviruses, but also to other viruses, uh, for example, in the context of uh, an acute Epstein-Barr virus uh, infection. Um, then one should not jump to the conclusion if a patient or a group of patients has a positive antibody results, that this means protection. Um, and this is a very big uh, gap between, in, in our knowledge, we still do not know what protection actually means. Um, and there's much more research to be going on. And we probably need in the future, particularly after the availability of, of vaccines. We need um, new form, formulas, test formulas, which include probably also the measurement against certain epitopes or certain proteins that are part of the, of the vaccine. This would be important. Um, so the tests need to be adopted probably pretty soon and not stay as it is, but we need to adopt this. And then just to remind everybody again, it is probably wiser to use molecular biology for acute infection and not the serology, but for the community level, it is a very good uh, addition to, to molecular biology to have uh, good uh, serology essays. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Liebert. And I think that's one of the sort of the key aspects that we highlight in terms of how serology testing 
it is not intended to sort of replace molecular testing. We're not saying that in any of part of our consensus um, document, but it has a role, a complementary role, and they can be used together, particularly in community settings. And as we're gonna see later on um, in high risk groups and population hotspots as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for bringing that about. Um, now on to Ana Rita. Um, who's going to uh, provide us with um, her expertise and policy perspective. I would, we've sort of heard very much sort of the nitty-gritty technical limitations, but from a policy perspective, what are the biggest challenges around serology testing? So thank you, Julieta. And I, I'm really humbled by the company we keep in this panel as my uh, admiration for Dr. Lieber and Dr. Canton is huge. And of course for Julieta, so I'm so grateful to be here. But let's talk about um, policy. And I think the biggest challenge we have is that all the WHO has acknowledged the importance of serology testing for research purposes and for epidemiological surveillance. They have been shy in providing clear guidelines on how to do this testing and how to roll out this testing. So this is added by the concern that as we all know, Europe is a very heterogeneous region with different political perspectives, different ideologies, different health systems, and the difference in applying the use of serology testing cuts also has a missed opportunity of building quality data that will allow for better policies to be set, for more protections to the health system, for um, avoiding that the health system becomes overwhelmed, and also for providing individuals with more information. I think the, the last comment I want to make is the fact that um, this pandemic has been plagued by a season in our lives in which all these things about fake news and lack of information and different information, are scientists right or are scientists wrong? And in every facet of life, when there is a new disease, there is misinformation or there's partial information that we learn as we go. And I think that the lack of public awareness and education and information doesn't fill the vacuum that people feel. And serology testing and understanding through serology testing how the virus is behaving and, and how we can help manage a second wave will be very important to keep people a little peace of mind and a little bit more patience to keep pushing um, while we go through these processes and we get treatments and vaccines. And also, Anarita, it's, it's a bit of what we saw in Europe when we were understanding the challenges was that it was a bit of a fragmented approach as well, right? Given the, totally. the differences in the, in the countries um, and the different sort of outlooks that they've had to the pandemic. So there's a bit of a, of a fragmented approach and a lack of coordination in terms of the rolling out of the serology test as well. Definitely. Great, thank you. So, um, Professor Liebert, um, in terms of the future benefits, and I know you touched a bit on this, if we can sort of go and provide more details in terms of the future benefits of serology testing, um, particularly from a laboratory perspective. Well, we deal with uh, SARS-CoV-2. It's a novel virus, and this, and we do not know everything and we are far from knowing everything. So uh, one important question related to ser serology testing is, is a virus monotypic or has it very many variants that may actually be missed by a serolo serologic test? So um, we really have to see and monitor how uh, variants or mutants of the virus evolve. That would be uh, very important for serology uh, tests. And also, as I mentioned before, with the vaccine, uh, with the availability of vaccines, you probably need a test that really gives you an answer to all different, and there may be different vaccines, to all different vaccine strategies. And, uh, and you probably have to, to uh, uh, test with an equal sensitivity 
and specificity, the immune response to a potential vaccine. That will be very important. So I think uh, all the serology tests, they're not stationary. So you don't sit back, lean back and say, now I have a, a serology test, but we have to further improve these assays during the upcoming months. Thank you so much, Professor Liebert. And sort of um, providing more detail on that, um, Dr. Fenton, if you can um, provide us more around the benefits related to the use of serology testing, um, particularly from the hospital perspective, and also if any specific groups should be um, prioritized in terms of the use of serology testing as well. Dr. Fenton, you're, you're in mute. Well, I'm, I'm with you now. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yes, well, no, no worry. That. That's, the, that's the phrase of 2020. You're on mute, I think. I saw yeah. that somewhere. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, uh, I, I was telling that it, it is very clear the benefit of testing the serology in the patients and, and also to take all the data as a group. And, and here we have very nice examples in different countries. And also, we, we will probably compare those countries that has high levels or, or serology, IgGs in the population, with those countries that has low level in the population, and how is going to be the second wave of the virus. So I think we still have to know uh, with this data. But obviously, uh, we, we, for instance, in our country, we have a very nice study in Spain, just uh, taking uh, a representative population and we know in different regions of the of Spain, uh, which is the positive uh, IgG in this population. Even we have this data uh, in different hospitals uh, within one population, and we can see difference in between them. So probably one thing that we have to do is the follow up of this population just to learn more. As uh, Professor Lieber said, we, we know a lot of things of the virus, but we still have to know more things. And even in that case, we can uh, do some strategies, future strategies of vaccination of this population. And, and probably the high risk uh, of this population will be people working in hospitals, uh, in healthcare seat settings, but also people living in long-term care facilities. I think this data will be very useful to manage as a global uh, in the way of uh, epidemiology. Great, thank you so much. I see that we have a lot of questions, um, which we will get to them shortly. And we love it that there are so many questions and interest from part of, uh, of the audience. Um, Anarita, I would like to ask you, now that we sort of um, talked about serology testing, a bit of the limitations and the benefits um, and the challenges as well, does serology testing have a place at the national testing strategy? So here you will have to shut me up because I have so many things to say. So first of all, definitely, um, we need a very robust national testing strategy. We and serology testing does have a place in the national testing strategy. It is very clear and it should be very present that it does not replace molecular testing, but it complements it. And that's what is so important about it. Um, so serology will help us understand the behavior of the virus and help, help us understand the immunity behavior. So um, as Dr. Lieber was saying, as we get a vaccine, it will become even more important to have serology testing. So it's so important that we uh, push for making sure that our national strategy considers not only diagnosis, but it, that it considers all of these aspects that will help us contain uh, a pandemic, that will help us contain a second wave. So it is so, so important that we make sure that all of the elements of the testing strategy are in place and that that testing strategy is properly funded so it can be executed. Great, thank you, Ana Rita. Um, I would like to ask Professor Liebert, so um, do you think that serology testing is the missing link that will solve the situation in terms of the pandemic or what's the role? Well, um, this is an interesting question, in fact, uh, and I'm not going to 
contradict myself uh, on what I said before. I think it has a great potential. It can be a very important component of the strategy to combat the virus, but we still do not know whether antibody positivity tells us anything in terms of protection. That probably will be a important missing link or uh, still in the serology testing. Um, nobody should think I have antibodies, so I'm safe. I can deal uh, with unprotected with patients. I can uh, disregard all these measurements um, like uh, uh, mask wearing, like uh, uh, this, uh, social distancing, social distancing. Things like that. Mm -hmm. That is definitely not the role of our serology tests as we have them today. What we need, and that is, then we really have a missing link uh, and uh, have this close to this missing link. Uh, if we could tell from uh, a serology test what protection means, nobody really could, uh, should think that having an IgG or whatever response uh, would uh, something pre uh, be like an uh, immunity passport, like something the allowance to, to, to work or to, to uh, act uh, as in the pre-pandemic uh, uh, era. This is probably not the case and nobody should think that that uh, this would be probably something like the freedom to to behave as one wishes so serology should not be overstressed thank you professor liebert um and rita um does serology testing have a role um to help countries better prepare does it have a role in restarting economy Definitely, and, and, and I echo uh, Dr. Liebert's words in terms of, you know, don't give, uh, don't use it to give you a false sense of security. Uh, even uh, issues like we're talking about these immunity passports and things like that, that definitely, um, personally, I think uh, that most of the public health um, uh, professionals in the world disagree with because they can bring more problems than solutions. Um, but definitely serology testing is very important should be a, a, a cornerstone of uh, really how to prepare. First of all, because it will benefit the health system. So um, if you do properly serology testing, you lower the demand for hospital services, for example. You can work on um, rapid triage of people with symptoms so that they can um, be put in the place where they need to be. Um, that will allow for best use of, of the resources that we have, that we all know that there's cars and although they're um, trying to put more resources because it's such a, a dramatic thing, it will be scarce. And, and we need to make sure that we use the, the, the COVID resources in the most intelligent way because we cannot abandon the rest of the diseases and the rest of the needs of the population uh, in terms of health. And um, I think it also will help with the mapping of, of the hotspots and the populations at risk and really um, developing more targeted community interventions that will help contain the pandemic. Great, thanks, Enrita. Um, based on that, Dr. Canton, um, what do we need to add um, serology testing um, to our strategy and its implementation? And how can hospitals and laboratories contribute to this? Well, I think if we believe, and I think this is the case that we need uh, to test serology, uh, you, you have to do your best uh, to produce this, uh, these results. So depending on your organization, but normally you have the machines in your labs. This is the quite normal to have this. If not, you have to provide this uh, to the laboratories to produce them. But if you have the machines uh, for the suppliers, you can easily introduce the serology in your uh, workflow of the laboratory. It's normally very easy. 
it, it is more easy or easier in those laboratories that has an automatized uh, devices uh, because you have the personnel. Obviously, you have to train this personnel to do the capacity of them, uh, to do the quality testing, the quality assurance that you are doing well with the, with the testing. And also, you need a strategy on how to report and how to inform the results according to the test that you are using and also the levels that you are going to measure and how to interpret that. And it's very clear that this interpretation should be performed for by the personnel that is trainee, not only to do the test, but also for the professional, the staffs that are allowed to perform this and to uh, explain how is the results to the, to the, to the providers. Great, thank you. Um, Ana Rita, so what role can the hospitals play to promote serology testing? So I think it's an important uh, role because we all know that the hospital, as criticized as they could be, is the cornerstone, what we feel comfortable with. If we're sick and even if we have a, a clinic nearby, we would prefer to go to the hospitals because we trust hospitals. So hospital can help not only with their labs and the testing, but also with training others in the health system, in other parts of the health system to, to be able to do the testing correctly. Uh, it could help to build the data sets, the, the information gathering tools that are needed to make the best use of serology testing and also to help educate. Uh, not only educate the population, but educate providers in and outside of the hospital on how to best use serology testing, how best to communicate, how best to inform form and explain to, to patients and communities the results of serology testing. And, and as I said before, um, the hospital needs to have a very strong voice in, in demonstrating that a good and solid national testing strategy will allow for um, its resources, its capacity, its structure to be more functional and more effective. Um. Great. So I think um, we can jump into the Q&A. George, can we do that to sort of, we still have a couple of minutes left and there are yeah, lots of questions. Um, so we would love to jump into that. Would you want to do a poll now or later? Let's do the poll afterwards. Let's do some of the questions now. I think the questions, there's already 15 really good questions. Let's start with those. Okay, um, great. So I'd encourage the panel to have a look at the questions and we'll speak to some of them live right now. Um, and uh, some of them might be able to be answered by text very quickly, but, um, but while we look at the questions, um, um, uh, Julieta, do any of the questions stand out to you as a good one to start with? Or even the panelists, if you see a question that you'd like to begin with, just let us know. And I know there's a lot to read there. Yeah. Well, there, um, there are some, yeah. Some technical question here, uh, Julieta. For instance, one of them is that there is various publications, so no delay between SARS-CoV-2, IgG, and IgM. Yeah. Would you comment? I, I can give my opinion, but of course, Professor Oliver, you are all, you are an expert. But but this is very clear. It, it's not the, the, the dynamics of production. This IgG is uh, is similar in all the population. And uh, curiously here, we, we saw a no so big delay in the production of the IgG regarding the IgM. Probably this is also depending the levels that we are doing the measure. The IgM normally appears uh, before the IgG, but if we have a higher level, we are going to detect this better than the IgG. So probably there is no a so big delay than we have in another infection, but we still need uh, some more data uh, to, to see that. Yes, I certainly agree with this, uh, uh, but I would remind everybody that uh, the uh, SARS coronavirus is an airborne virus and it uh, affects the patient first on the mucous membranes of the upper respiratory tract. And so in this uh, situation, uh, from other viruses, we know that IgM antibodies do not play the major role. 
I was still wondering how about IgA antibodies, but unfortunately the tests available so far are rather um, giving very mixed results. So they are uh, cross-reacting with other uh, infectious agents. So it's, it's a difficult task, but when it comes to vaccination, of course, then we need to measure IG, IgG. So for IgM, I do not see that much of the necessi necessity. Yeah since we do not want to uh, diagnose acute infections. And I think we can jump into the, there's a couple of vaccination questions, which I think would sort of fit nicely into this discussion, Professor Liebert, um, around, um, do you think it would be valuable to introduce a pre-vaccination screening strategy? Um, and how can serology testing help advance uh, developing a vaccine? And one is that if antibodies uh, in response of an infection don't confer immunity, why would a vaccination or a vaccine do so? So I think there's a couple in terms of vaccination that we can cover. There's a lot of interest in vaccination. Yeah, uh, we understand that. I, I think everybody is waiting for a vaccine and a good vaccine. We, we still have no vaccine available that has been fully tested. And, and so um, that would be, and that, that's why I said we have to um, work on the serology tests and probably to find some antigens, part of antigens, epitopes that really correlate with protective immunity. And that is a big question, the protective immunity. And that can only be done either by challenge experiments, that's what, what we would do with animal experiments, or you do it by serology, if you have this correlation. And so I, I would think that uh, screening uh, larger parts of the population with an antibody test, a pre-vaccine screening would be very helpful and then to see what is really changed uh, after the introduction of the uh, vaccine. But again, be careful and be cautious. Uh, the vaccine will not be available for the next um, well, couple of months, no, probably for the next four, five, six months. So it re really takes quite a long time before a vaccine is available for the general population anyway. Okay. Um, in, Professor Liebert, um, once again, when you were talking about viral, um, viral variants, um, so you mentioned those, and then so the question is whether those viral variants um, can influence um, serological assays. So the question is, do you have data for this to show um, how, how viral uh, variants um, can influence serological yeah. evaluation? Do you have data? <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we, we have data, not our own data, but just from the literature. Um, so particularly if you uh, look at the surface antigen, you will see variants, and we have seen variants, which is just a point mutation. And if this is in an essential epitope for B, T cells, then you can have a strong influence on uh, serology tests. Um, Again, if that is the surface antigen, the other major antigen that is used in serology assays is the N, the nucleocapsid antigen. And here you have the relatively high uh, risk of having cross or creating cross reactive antibodies with the seasonal uh, coronaviruses. And um, well, it's, it's really, you have to decide. Uh, the, all those assays that are on the market, either the uh, S antigen or the nucleocapsid antigen, they are quite uh, reliable, but both tests have some uh, false positives and false negative results. This is really such a new field that that the, the tests cannot be 100% um, 
so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so there's a question, and I think all of us can sort of chip in into this, um, which is sort of um, if we can really sort of spell out the clear benefits and the role that serology testing has um, currently, and specifically this this can be answered together with the question about the role in terms of studies. So based on what we found and we discussed, the role of serology testing is for zero surveillance. So you wouldn't use serology testing for population surveys, right? It is not recommended because there's a low prevalence, right? It's a low prevalence setting. So you want to use serology testing and the value that it brings is for zero surveillance and to sort of identify um, high risk situations and the geographical hotspots. Um, in addition to that, for the, I think for the clinical or for the hospital setting, um, Dr. Canton, if you can sort of um, maybe give us the specific details in which situation would you use serology testing? So for example, is it whether um, for a rapid triage of patients um, when you have limited access to molecular tests, like if we can sort of give the audience a real feel of the actual benefits and uses of serology testing in the clinical setting as well. Yes, I, I, I think it, it's, it's very clear that uh, when you have an acute patient that uh, came to the hospital or you attended in a, in a, as an outpatient patient, if the patient is in an acute situation, you are going to use a PCR or now you can use also the, the antigen te test if the patient has less than five or seven days of the appearance of the symptoms. But sometimes this is not the case, uh, depending the symptoms that has the patient. And sometimes the patient appear in the hospital when they had 10 days or even more for the appearance of the symptoms. And there, in this situation, the probability to have a negative result of the PCR is very high, or even the antigen test. And the, uh, the only possibility to know if the patient has been related of the appearance of these symptoms that could be related with the appearance with the, with the COVID uh, or, or the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 is to perform a serology. And, and I think this is the most uh, the, the clear uh, indication of the serology just to know if the patient of this patient that has a PCR negative was in contact with the, with the SARS-CoV-2. Great, yeah. Um, and there's also what, what I mentioned and what has been done, for example, in certain Latin American countries and situations in which um, you have obviously limited molecular tests and limited uh, resources in hospitals. So you do a rapid triage um, with serology testing and with that, you make a decision whether or not the person should go and get um, a molecular test and go to the hospital. So we've had sort of those strategies as well that we have used um, in the Latin American setting. And I think one of the questions was, what is sort of the, the, the window or the timing in terms of when to do um, serology testing? Um, I think it's a bit complex. There are some opinions that it should be after five to 10 days after symptoms. I would love to sort of hear your opinion, um, Dr. Canton. Yes, well, in that situation, I, I think you, you can do obviously this, uh, this test, but, but the problem is that the patient is in, a, in the very beginning, sometimes you, get, you, you will lose the, the, the patient with COVID and you will only have the clinical data of the patient, even, even in that case, using the IEM. The Dr. Lieber explained very well the caveats that we, or the concerns that we have the, with the IEM. So I do not recommend uh, to use uh, only this strategy uh, as a way of, of, of taking care of the patient. Obviously, if you don't have any other possibility, you are going to do the serology, but you will need to repeat the serology if it is negative uh, in certain days, probably in five days later or, or even 10 days later, because you are going to lose basic information. Okay. Lieta, may I just Yes, jump of course. In? Um, <laughs> very briefly, even in the case that you have a negative molecular result and antigen result negative, and say the serology is negative, but the clinician says it is, the symptoms are likely to be related to, to SARS coronavirus, you have to repeat, you must repeat 
the uh, molecular biology and the serology. So it's sometimes you come into a situation that the clinician decides what is the likely uh, well case. Is, is it contact to coronavirus or is it some other uh, uh, respiratory virus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So definitely you have to repeat and in a hospital situation, you probably should try to repeat uh, your tests. Also serology. I, timing is always, is also important, very important. Yeah. In yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, talking about timing and the, and the hospital and the clinical setting, we have a recent question, which is very interesting. Um, so it says, we see many patients with a credible history of COVID-19, PCR positive, who make weak or no evidence IgG response to the SARS-CoV, um, yet there are a few reported cases of reinfection. Is there any better test of immunity for such patients? Dr. Liebert is sort of smiling, <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> answer the question. It, it, it's a very important question, definitely. Um, so we hoped that an in vitro neutralization assay, which you do under biosafety level three uh, laboratories, that this would give you the answer. But unfortunately, the neutralization tests do not correlate, not in all cases correlate with the uh, amount of antibodies that you measure with the with a uh, big machine. Yeah. So is there a better test? No, definitely no. And we all have seen patients that uh, get a second uh, sorry, a reinfection, a true reinfection with a different variety, a different, um, uh, yeah, whatever, uh, mutation of the virus. And yeah, that occurs. We cannot say is is about in five percent of cases or is it in one percent of cases, but it definitely occurs. Anything to add, Dr. Santon? No, 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 no. This is there is this is very clear as uh, it is not very frequent, but we are seeing this type of patients, and and I think we we have to follow up this patient just to to understand what, what is happening really with them, because even with a positive serology or IgG, we can see a potential reinfection in the patient. It's very unusual, but we have very few cases of that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great discussion. I can see there's still nine questions left and it'd be great if we can get to them. What I would suggest we do in the last five minutes is I'm gonna launch one last poll for our participants to, to let us, to share with us their thinking. I'll ask the panel if they can read over all of the questions that remain. Mm -hmm. See if there's anything we haven't yet answered, and maybe you can each come back and answer one more of the questions. Professor Liebert um, and Dr. Canton, is there any specific question that jumps to your attention? There's interesting about um, ortho orthogonal testing, which we actually include um, in our consensus document, and we recommend as well. There's a question in that. Um, Julieta, I, I wanted to yes. say while you're looking at these questions that there is, mm -hmm. you know, I look at the questions and there are no policy related questions, but I want to say that if we had um, solid guidelines and very clear pathways that a lot of these questions will be answered. So I think it is very important that we develop answers, we know the answers, but also that we pursue policies that will ensure that there is a, a broad understanding of what is best and that we made it available to everyone that can benefit from it. Great, yes. Very important to keep the, the public health and policy um, perspective as well. So basically, is, do our speakers agree that we should first understand the different uses um, that may require um, tests with different performances. And often serology is used with no consideration to this aspect. So what, if I understand correctly, what they're trying to ask from this question is that we have, that we should have different tests with different performances according to the different uses. So for example, if we have a test for um, screening, it should be a different performance versus if we have a test for diagnosis. 
Well, I, I think we, we always need a, a, well, a test that has a very, very high specificity. Specificity. If we are going to do a very, uh, an epidemiological study, this will be probably the most important one. To have this with a very high specificity. In the other side, uh, if the test has also a very high sensitivity, we can use this uh, test for the patient care. But at the end, if we have a test with high high specificity and sensitivity, this will be the, the optimal test to be used in all the situation. This is my, mm -hmm. my opinion in that case. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so there's one on immunity, which I personally find very interested as well to Professor Lieber. So it says, current evidence shows that one, most people seroconvert, two, most have neutralizing antibodies, three, very few documented cases of reinfection until now. Wouldn't this be enough to confirm that past infection confers immunity? No. That's a tough I, one. <laughs> I definitely disagree. I no, disagree you disagree? It. Yeah, I, I, I disagree that uh, all patients with, with a SARS corona infection do develop antibodies. This is clearly not the case. Uh, it's in our in our hospital is about 25 to 30 percent of patients who do not develop antibodies that's the first uh, answer the the second thing is that these antibodies in some cases and this is not very uh, rare cases do not persist for a longer period of time they they are present for 10 weeks 12 weeks and maybe for uh, four months, but then they decline and rapidly decline. And we have seen in our hospital, uh, 1,500 uh, beds, we, we have seen so far um, at least seven patients with a reinfection. And I think it's not that rare that you really say uh, it's, uh, it doesn't occur. So antibodies, the antibody testing is fine, but you have to be careful to interpret the results. Um, okay, so what are the prospects to develop a multi-antigen antibody test to enable the dissection of different antibody outcomes after various clinical pictures and vaccines of different types? Dr. Lieber, you are doing? I do not like these uh, multi-antigen no. serology tests. I think we need a specific test as Professor Canton uh, already said, we need the highest uh, specificity. And if you do a multiplex assay, you lose uh, on, on specificity. So I wouldn't really recommend such an uh, antibody, anti, antibody test. Yeah. Okay, so we're nearly at, we, in fact, we are, we have, we've hit the one hour mark. And um, so it'd be good to wrap it up. Um, up now. I understand some people might have to leave us now. Uh, speakers, uh, panelists, are there any last things that you want to speak to before we before we end? Because in one way, I'd like to let the conversation go on. We, we've got some great discussion here, but um, is there anything, any final comment on any of those questions that you can make before we end? Maybe as a final round, if we could do a, a final statement from each person? Well, I, I think one of the uh, key messages is just to, to use the serology as wise as possible. And, and I come back to the first uh, question that was uh, uh, performed to me. Yes, to ha you have to do as an epidemiologic study, the, the surveillance study is, is very clear, but even in the management of patients, the, the results will be very, very useful, combining with, a, with another test that you are going to perform in your, in your laboratory. Great, and um, um, Professor Uwe Liebert? Yeah, well, I think uh, one probably sh should, even as a laboratory uh, person, one should not be too confident on the test results. So be careful and discuss with the clinicians what the results really mean. That's a very important uh, part. Thank you. And uh, Ana Rita? What are your final yeah, I think I, I sort of gave my final comment in the in the last question, but I strongly believe that we need to push for clinical uh, guidelines. We need to push for um, a national testing strategy. We need to push for resources for implementing this um, because of the heterogeneity of the region. 
we cannot go doing each of us whatever we want to do and not creating a, a better environment for uh, for a return to to some sense of normality. Yeah, absolutely. So Julieta, you have given us the most comprehensive coverage, which means I'm looking to you for the for the real. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for that, yeah, no pressure for the closing remarks. Yeah. No, I think. We've, ha we've had a great panel discussion and I think part of the, the challenge of, of this document, of this discussion is that it's live. So information is, is it's rapidly changing and we have new data, um, which actually makes us um, update. So we need like current updates and we need to sort of stay alive in terms of the, the new data that's coming out. Um, so I don't think there are any sort of black and white answers to any of this. Um, I think that's part of the scientific approach that we have to take to this pandemic and that we have to recognize the value of serology testing as a complement to molecular testing and to sort of um, understand its benefits and its role in terms from both a research perspective and a clinical perspective. Terrific. That has been an amazingly informative um, webinar. What I want to say to the participants is I want to thank you for your time. I hope you've you found this informative. This is the first in a series that we're running with, with Abbott. So, um, so stay tuned if you want to learn more about this. And uh, Abbott will also be at the EMA conference on the 17th and the 19th of November. So if you haven't yet registered for the conference, make sure you do that um, so we can further having sort of discussions like this. Um, I really, I, I thank um, all of our speakers, um, Professor Canton, um, Anarita Gonzalez, Professor Liebert, uh, thank you so much for your generosity of time and for being with us. And uh, Julieta um, Villegas, your presentation was great and thank you for your great coordination for today. It was a pleasure. Great. Um, thanks to Abbott, thanks to all of the team at EMA who helped put this together and uh, stay tuned. Let's keep talking everyone. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.